you were speaking already. <laughs> um, I'm actually I'm still reading something. Okay, go ahead. So we'll start in just a couple of minutes when some commissioners catch up on what we've been given just as we walked in. So. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the May 2nd regular meeting of the City of Santa Cruz Planning Commission meeting. We'll call the meeting to order and ask for a roll call, please, staff. Commissioner Schifrin? Here. Conway? Here. Stallman? Here. Nielsen? Here. Greenberg? Here. Singleton? Here. Chair Pepping? Present. Are there any statements of disqualification for any of the items on our, on our agenda tonight? Seeing none, um, we would move to oral communications next, but uh, Vice Chair Spellman brought up the suggestion that we move item number five, the public hearing on the Brook Avenue right of way issue to earlier in the agenda so that um, those that the, anyone interested in that doesn't have to sit through a couple of other pieces. Um, I know Dr. Tiffany Wise West is here and we almost always Recently, we've put her really late in the agenda, so maybe I'm going to suggest and um, look for kind of nods of approval or disapproval that we move number five to number three. Okay, we're going to do that then, and so the um, we will then open the next section on the agenda is oral communications, and we'll invite the public to talk about every item on our agenda, but this section is for the public to address the commission on any item that is not on the agenda. So welcome if you'd line up and state your name if you would please um, sign in um, and you have three minutes. Welcome. Thank you. Shelley Hatch. I brought this wonderful poster. I thought you might have it up tonight. I came across it when I was going to the planning department last year. It was in the display case in front and May is preservation month. 
in Santa Cruz. Old is the new green. Sustainability and continuity are stressed. And I thought it was very important and I thought you would be having your celebration tonight over uh, maybe in preservation month. I hope that sometime that can become agendized as a topic of discussion at the Planning Commission. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else that would like to address the commission for items not on the agenda tonight? Seeing none, we'll close oral communications and move on to approval of minutes. We've had the minutes circulated from the April 18th meeting. and Actually, it's a little uh, strange, I think, because the minutes um, include a detail of what was decided last month with the uh, uh, commission meeting guidelines, but it wasn't totally accurate. So I was going to uh, uh, suggest a couple of changes that the commission approved, but a lot of changes were made and the staff didn't catch all of them. But then when we get to the consent agenda, the staff has submitted a whole further revision of the meeting guidelines. So. I'm not quite sure why there was no staff report that explained the changes that the staff was proposing that were different than what the commission unanimously approved last time. But uh, I'm not sure procedurally how best to proceed. I would, uh, there were two cha minor changes to the minutes in terms of the meeting guidelines. One, uh, the commission approved setting a maximum total time of oral communications rather than giving a specific time. And then there was a suggestion to move the sign-in recommendation from under oral communications to under the just suggestions for speakers because we do like to have people sign up for every, uh, every time they speak rather than just oral communication. So those were two uh, changes that I'd like to put into the minutes because they reflect what the commission approved last last time, if there's no objections to that. Okay, so we're sounds like you're going to want to pull item th three off of consent and discuss that. We're, right now, we should just focus on the accuracy yeah, I think of the we minutes. Just deal with the minutes. So, unless somebody else has a concern, I'd move the minutes as amended. <coughs> those two changes. I'll second that. So we have a motion and a second. All in favor of approving the minutes as amended? Aye. 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 <clears throat> that passes unanimously with my abstention that was not here, 6-0. Uh, and the next item on the agenda is, uh, thank you for those, Mr. Schiffer. The next item on the agenda is a climate action annual update, which of course we get annually. And welcome Dr. Tiffany Wise West uh, with a staff report. Thank you so much. Good evening, commissioners. I'm really thrilled to be here this evening. I am Tiffany Wisewest, the Sustainability and Climate Action Manager for the City of Santa Cruz. Um, and this is my annual report. And you are the first body to actually receive this report this year. And I do thank you and the rest of the staff for putting me soon on the agenda closer this year. Last year, I think we came on at 1030. <coughs> Um, just to orient you to the climate action plan uh, again, so our plan was adopted in 2012. Um, it is the first plan that the city has adopted, and it contains 12 climate action milestones that are tracked through 13 indicators uh, eat, that each have targets. And, excuse me, there are 254 actions that um, are specified to achieve those goals. So as the a climate action manager, I do lead the strategy on emissions reduction as well as adaptation, but certainly this is not a one person uh, kind of thing. I work really widely uh, with department heads and the rest of the community on this work. Um, and I thought I would share with you some of the key uh, action plan implementers. So I meet every other month with department heads, uh, quarterly with the Community Climate Action Task Force, which was just recently uh, reseated with the new mayor. 
you can see on the right hand side the kinds of things that we worked on. Uh, the keep it cool business oriented energy conservation campaign could not have happened uh, without our climate action task force. And they also have been um, really key in an anti idling campaign we have going on with the schools right now. Uh, their work on the adaptation plan update this past year and they've recently launched uh, a working group looking at green leases and rentals. Um, they've also begun working on the scoping of our Climate and Energy Action Plan 2030 because our current plan actually sunsets in 2020. So we will be embarking upon that plan process uh, in fiscal year 2020. We also have an employee sustainability team with representatives from basically every department and there are a number of standard things that that group does each year. We make the awards from our internal carbon fund to fund other carbon reducing projects. We do lots of promotion around things like Clean Air Day, uh, Bike Month, which is happening right now and kudos to those of you I noticed who rode up on your bikes today. Um, we also annually complete an evaluation of the capital improvements program projects for whether or not they implement the climate action plan and just this year we also reviewed them for uh, how they implement the climate adaptation plan and both those lists are on the on the uh, beginning of the budget document so it gives uh, decision makers uh, feedback on uh, when they're making decisions on the budget. Um, of course this group is also really key in the climate and energy action plan scoping and we've taken a couple field trips this past year, uh, notably to the energy storage facility in the basement of the county building. Um, this is just a list of really the, the folks I work with on a more day-to-day -day basis on this work, but I also should mention that in the community, I work with the Green Schools Committee, the County Commission on the Environment, which I sit on with um, Chair Pepping, um, as well as I'm the chair of the Central Coast Climate Collaborative and work really closely with the Monterey Bay Regional Climate Action Compact, which is our sub-regional um, collaborative. So on to the Climate Action Plan and there's lots to share with you here. So we have these little infographics that kind of show you at a glance where we are with progress. So since we're in year 10 of 12 right now, um, we should be assuming kind of a linear path at 83% progress if we are going to achieve our goals. So right now uh, we have three targets that have been achieved, five that are on track to be achieved and five that are not on track to be achieved. And I think it's important to mention that when we developed these ambitious goals, we as residents of Santa Cruz already have a very high environmental ethic and the baselines for many of these um, goals is very high to begin with, so, so they are quite ambitious. Um, of those 254 actions that we specified to reach these goals, 30% have already been complete and about another 34% are uh, ongoing or in progress. So let's jump right in. Reduce energy use in municipal buildings by 40%. So here we're excluding the wastewater treatment facility, the water treatment facility, conveyance, uh, pump stations, as well as street lighting. Um, and what we saw is a slight increase uh, this past year. So we're only showing a 7% decrease in energy use. However, as I've noted here, I think it's really important, particularly for this milestone, and I'm bummed that we lead with this, is that the data are kind of spotty for this one. We have unfortunately had to pull from different data sources due to PG&E uh, preventing our accessibility to our typical data sources. And there are changes that PG&E makes in what they make available that is not consistent year to year. So I think it's really important to point out that, you know, there's not a lot of change really going on here, um, but that the data it's suspect and so we're constantly kind of looking for ways to improve our um, data collection on this one in particular. However, with that said, there are several things going on that lead me to believe that we still have a shot at making a dent in this one. First of all, 
Last year, we completed a number of CEC loan projects, California Energy Commission loan projects that were HVAC, lighting, and so forth. We haven't seen the impact of that hit um, our energy usage yet. Secondly, we received a California Energy Commission grant to do advanced building energy controls at the annex building behind us and also at PD that just got installed uh, within the past few months. So again, haven't seen the impact of that. That really will optimize uh, the HVAC operation. And then last, we just got approved by pg e some on-bill financing for some more lighting projects. So we do have a lot of projects in the works here. And I, I want to note that <clears throat> just this year, we're receiving from the Air District the Clean Air Leaders Award for the work that our Public Works Department uh, Facilities Division, and notably our Energy Projects Coordinator Andy Shatney, has been doing on lighting retrofits, it's been astounding the quantity of retrofits he's been doing. So for that, we're getting a Clean Air Leaders Award later in the month. And then I also want to highlight that for the first time, and this is a very rare award to be able to get across California, the Local Government Commission issues what's called the Beacon Award. And the Beacon Award, a full Beacon Award, acknowledges or recognizes an agency's holistic approach to addressing climate change and we are one of the few cities that will be getting a full Beacon Award this year. This is the second time we've got a Clean Air uh, Leader Award, and this is the sixth Beacon Award, um, with it being the first full Beacon Award that we've received. So I really wanted to highlight those two things because the numbers really don't tell the whole story here. Okay, so moving along, uh, expanding energy efficiency programs to 30% of homes and businesses. So we have three things that we track here. We track our green building permits. We track uh, Central Coast Energy Services uh, jobs and households that they do low income weatherization and energy efficiency. And for the first time, we incorporated our Keep It Cool, that energy business conservation campaign that I mentioned, where we were able to get 215 businesses to say, yes, we'll keep the doors closed if we're running AC or heat. So this one is a difficult one whoop, for us to uh, really have influence on. That's strange. Sorry about that. Um, and so we've only really, you know, made 18% progress on this, but we continue to look for ways to incentivize homes and businesses to be able to take advantage um, of energy efficiency incentives that are out there right now. Um, the next one then is to, this one is pertains to renewable energy, and there are three metrics associated with this. First of all, we're looking to increase solar to 5,000 residents. We track this through the California Solar Initiatives Interconnection Agreements, and we have over 2,800 installations. Last year was our peak. Uh, we installed 460 systems last year. We went down this year, which is a little surprising considering the federal tax credit is going to start stepping down at the end of this year. So I would have expected more of a rush to install here. Um, maybe that will happen this year. Uh, I did talk with a couple solar contractors that did also acknowledge that last year was a light year for them as well. Um, notably also here, we do have a low income solar project that's being funded by our community development and block grants, uh, CDBG. And so we are funding the installation of three uh, solar systems on low income homes this year. And Monterey Bay Community Power, our power uh, procurement agency or community choice aggregator, is also offering grid alternatives for low-income uh, folks that are eligible uh, within the Tri-County area. Next is to uh, achieve 500 businesses uh, with solar. And this year, we this past year, we only had uh, two systems. That should be in 2018. Uh, apologies there. With a total of over 74 uh, systems, Again, this is a difficult one for us to really try to <clears throat> influence. You know, we do have the streamlined permitting and so forth, but uh, I'd love to do again at some point if we can find some funding, a commercial solar technical assistance project that we did in 2015 that resulted in three uh, additional installations. 
And then finally, uh, one that we are on track to achieve is to supply 33% of our uh, municipal building load with renewables. So here we define renewable energy as electricity from methane, which is the majority of that renewable energy component, and then the rest from solar, which is at about 7% right now. What you see on these, this graph uh, where there are the sunshine is where we've had some major installations take place of solar PV. And uh, this past year, we got to fully realize our Bay Street Reservoir installation in 2017 and um, what that's providing for us. Uh, so this one, we are on track. And by the way, we also will be, we're in the process of writing RFPs uh, for the corporation yard and expansion of that solar system, as well as one at the landfill. So we're expecting those to be installed or at least under contract by the end of the year and break ground. This is one that we've already achieved, partnering with UCSC on 25 sustainability and alternative energy projects. Um, we have all kinds of things to point to, our renewable energy test bed at the wharf that has the wind turbine, the bifacial uh, solar street lamp, uh, and EV charging station. We've done uh, tree plantings this year as part of our urban tree inventory project. Um, we've done bike commute workshops and so forth. So I think we are at 31 uh, projects right now. Uh, one of my more recent collaborations right now is with the Coastal uh, Policy and or Coastal Science and Policy Grad Program. They're working with me on our Resilient Coast Initiative, which I'll tell you a little about a little bit about in a moment. Next, ensuring that the rail corridor supports bike and pedestrian use. How we track this one is by the percentage of the 3.5 miles of the trail. Uh, that is within city limits that's funded either for design or construction. And there has been no change uh, since 2017. We are still at 92% of that trail um, is funded for design or construction. And as you all know, the uh, Trestle Bridge uh, expanded uh, path is under construction right now and should be ready for summer. Next, uh, for water conservation, we don't really have specific targets um, for water conservation, but what we like to share is our per capita or per person water use, as well as our annual water savings as compared to 2013 when we were under um, a mand mandatory rationing. So you can see the graph on the left-hand side shows per capita water use in Santa Cruz, the Central Coast in California, the Green Line, Santa Cruz, and as is usually the case year to year, we uh, can serve much better than the rest of the region and the state. And you can also see that since that emergency uh, rationing had been um, released, we had been released from that in 2014, we continue to conserve relative to 2013 at 21 percent uh, below 2013 uh, volumes. So, you know, great job, City of Santa Cruz um, and its residents in continuing to uh, conserve water. Next uh, is our uh, achieve 75 percent total waste diversion and maximize organic waste diversion. Um, we have taken a little bit of a dip the past two years. We're at a 60. 5.5 diversion rate, again, trying to get to 75%. Um, I have to suspect that China's national sword policy probably plays a role here um, in our diversion rate going down after several years of you know, upward tra trajectories. Um, we do continue to um, look at organic waste. There will be state mandates uh, requiring us to deal with organic waste. There is a commercial food waste pilot going on right now. Um, and I know that there's some equipment being installed at the landfill to prepare uh, for organic waste handling in the future. Okay, number eight is increased bike ridership to 12% of local commutes. So how we track this one is typically through the American Community Survey five-year average. Because American Community Survey does not make a, a, or conduct a survey every year. We use that five-year average, which did go down this year. I think it went down to 9.2%. Um, 
I should mention, first of all, that we had first made this target 10%. That was achieved in 2016. So we made a stretch goal of 12% by 2020. And although the five-year average has gone down, we did have for 2017 a one-year survey, which shows that bike ridership is actually now at 13.2%. So in a way, you can say that we've achieved that goal, just not the typical way that we track it. Um, number nine is to switch 20% of low carbon fuels uh, to, to low carbon fuels. And we track that through um, the Department of Motor Vehicles uh, registrations. And we found that 8.1% of cars on the road here in Santa Cruz zip codes um, are EVs or hybrids. So we're chugging along to that goal. Again, this is a difficult one for us to influence. However, we have been successful. Uh, we've submitted two proposals to Electrify America, which is the VW Settlement Agreement investment, 800 million in California, and have been successful. They are bringing two to four DC fast chargers. We're having a kickoff with them later in this month, as well as multifamily charging. So addressing that rental uh, market that often has difficulty in providing chargers. Also, Monterey Bay Community Power just yesterday launched their EV incentive program, which is very generous and very exciting. So I encourage all of you to check that out and spread the word on that. Between those two things, as well as a lot of incentives around EV charging, I'm hoping to see this really tick up next year. Number 10 is to retain 200 green businesses in the city. We're at 175 green businesses and we continue to make um, strides in this area. Um, we did add our Keep It Cool campaign as a measure um, for uh, green business certification, so we continue to partner uh, together to um, achieve this goal. And this, for the first time, I'm very glad to be able to report um, maintaining and increasing urban tree canopy by 10%. We have never been able to report on this metric before. Um, we got a grant through the UCSC Carbon Fund and matched that with city carbon fund dollars to hire the Center for Integrated Spatial Research at UCSC conduct, to conduct a canopy study. Uh, we did that for years 2009 through two th and 2016, the only years data are available. And what we saw was a 2% increase in canopy, which is great because our goal is trying to get us from that first baseline years, 36.4% really high to 40%, and we're at 38.2 right now. Also wanted to mention we've planted over 300 trees in the past year as part of our CAL FIRE grant, and our RFP for our GIS-based inventory is gonna be going out next week, so that should be done by the end of the year. And then our final uh, metric that we track is reducing single occupancy vehicle commutes 10%. So this has stayed static the past two years at 58.1%. Again, using that American Community Survey um, five-year average. Um, so, you know, we've made progress here, uh, but we're, we've been a little bit stalled out the past couple years. Hard to say why, um, but uh, we, you know, the downward trajectory and all is, is pretty good here. I thought it was interesting to share with you the mode split um, across different scales, the city, the county, California, and the US. Um, <clears throat> you can see that our uh, drive alone rate is lower than all the other scales, as is um, our transit, walking, and biking is the highest amongst all the scales, and uh, carpooling is where we're not doing as good as some of the other areas. and so. Um, as I believe you know, uh, our Public Works Department and planning are finalizing a transportation demand management program that really is gonna help um, with carpooling and providing incentives for alternative transportation to really get people out of their cars. Um, and so that's happening right now as well. Um, one other thing I wanna mention, I missed it on the EVs, is that we do have a large project at our corporation yard where we're installing 16 ports um, level two chargers for our fleet. We have our electric trolley, um, two trolleys that are coming online later this year. And we have plans for some other electric vehicles. We're gonna be pursuing some grants this year from the Air District for that, as well as our regular replacement program. Um, my very last thing then is uh, our greenhouse gas emissions goals. You know, through Monterey Bay Community Power, we were able to eliminate 59% of our energy emissions um, 
in 2018 because our emission factor for electricity is now zero. Um, we have achieved our emissions goal, uh, our 2020 emissions goal a year early, and we are on track to meet that 2050 goal. Um, we also will be, um, when we conduct our climate and energy action plan uh, process this next year, we're going to be reconsidering our goals, taking a look at some more aggressive goals that are more aligned with state goals, such as carbon neutrality by 2045. We'll be incorporating some of the elements of our climate emergency mobilization resolution. And a lot of that also will be aligned with the Green New Deal. I know there's a lot of interest in the Green New Deal right now. Um, and my very final slide is, I just wanna give you the quick adaptation update. I'm gonna be coming to you um, soon, within the next couple months, to talk to you about our Resilient Coast Initiative, which is our West Cliff Drive adaptation plan and a project to amend our local coastal program to include sea level rise policies. Um, that's a collaborative effort across the city. Um, we also have a sea level rise virtual reality uh, application that's in development to support the outreach of those Resilient Coast projects, as well as a card game that's getting ready to launch, and we're gonna be actually showcasing that at uh, the California APA conference later this year. The uh, Arts Commission has also funded a climate change theme performance art collaboration that started at Earth Day this past year. And we are doing our second Shrinking Shores event at World Oceans Day on June 8th in collaboration with Save Our Shores. So a lot going on in the adaptation space and more updates to come. And with that, I'll take any questions that you might have. <clears throat> Thank you for the presentation. Um, any questions for staff, uh, Commissioner Schiffrin? One, just a comment today at the uh, Regional Co uh, Transportation Commission meeting, uh, it was announced that the Trestle project will open on May, uh, over the San Lorenzo River will open on May 17th, and there may well be a um, grand opening spe uh, event on the 23rd. So that project has been is being completed uh, uh, earlier than anticipated. My schedule has to do with electrical, uh, electric vehicles mm -hmm. and wondering, given the priority that Monterey Bay Community Power is mm -hmm. giving it, how is that going to affect the city's fleet of vehicles? To what extent are they electric and what are the plans to the extent they're not to have them be electric? Sure. So thank you for that question and thank you also for letting us know on the early timeline on the Trestle Bridge. I was not aware of that. Um, Monterey Bay Community Power's uh, incentives right now are not necessarily geared towards local government fleets. However, the Air District does have um, incentives right now for fleet uh, vehicles to transition to electric. They also have grants that fund, you know, not the typical passenger car, but say, for example, um, a refuse truck, an electric refuse truck. So we are pursuing, we're right now kind of internally discussing what is the right project to go for this time around. Um, a couple of things are under consideration. We will be pursuing uh, a grant for you know, non-passenger vehicles. Right now, we have a number of vehicles that are like our parking, um, our parking enforcement carts that are electric. We have some new parks maintenance vehicles that are electric. And then we have a number of passenger vehicles that are electric and hybrid. I would say maybe six electric, and I don't even know how many hybrid, uh, a number of them. Our uh, fleet division and facilities division is in conversations right now with um, a leasing agency to see how we might accelerate our adoption of electric vehicles, because right now, cost is a barrier with the budget. <coughs> Excuse me. And so we are exploring ways that we can get low in a low cost way, get into more electric vehicles. We do not have a fleet electrification plan right now. So there is no kind of pathway or goals that we're trying to work towards. However, that will most surely be part of our climate and energy action plan 2030 that will begin developing next year. You're welcome. Any other comments or questions for staff from commissioners? As is our new practice, I think we invite the public to comment on everything, right? So um, we won't be taking action on this item. It's just for the commission to receive the update from staff, yet we will invite the public to address the commission if you have any comments 
um, please come um, for and for all comments, please come to the right side of the room and queue up and sign if you, sign in if you would please and uh, state your name if you're willing. Welcome. I, hi. I came to your presentation at the library <coughs> a couple of months ago, yeah. so this is interesting to hear too. I wondered if any of the statistics include the influx of the uh, non-resident cars, if those are dealt no, they with don't. in our num No, they do not. Very no. interesting, since there's millions a year. Yeah. Um, thank you, I wondered. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and is the air conditioning that was installed in City Hall somehow a clean energy way of doing air conditioning or just the? I don't know what fuel source that uh, air conditioning uses. If it's electricity, then it would be carbon free because we do procure our power from Monterey Bay Community Power. Yeah, uh, I would love to know, so I'll talk to you another time. <clears throat> yes, I can follow up on that with you. Sure. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else like to address the commission? Seeing none, then I guess I'll, I'll say uh, thank you for the update and for all the work. Congratulations on the awards. Uh, I had one question. Um, is it a staff effort to develop the 2030 plan, or is that what other process is there? <clears throat> staff will be leading that effort. There will be a community advisory committee, and it is anticipated that it will be budgeted for the first time we can actually hire a consultant to help us with that work. You know, one limitation on our energy planning and our fleet electrification is that we simply don't have the capacity and in some cases the tools to do the analytics that are required to look at this and set forth a path. So I'm very excited about having a consultant come on board and help us with this effort. So that is the plan. That funding would be available July 1 of next year. So we're anticipating, you know, we'll have someone selected by the end of the year and get started then. And do you imagine you'll consider changing some of the metrics based on your data capture, oh, data access challenges? And oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, everything will be opened up, all of the goals, the strategies, and so forth. Yeah, I'm anticipating it could be quite different. Mm. Commissioner Schiffer, did you have another comment or question? I just wanted to echo what you said in terms of thanking the staff for a very impressive uh, range of programs. And I'm very pleased to see that the outcomes are quantitative and being tracked over time. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just um, say that, you know, we're asking the public, no one's going to fix this challenge, and we're asking the public to do a lot, and it's nice. It's inspiring and appropriate, I think, that the city itself demonstrates leadership and sets an example for what folks can do. So thanks for leading that, Tiffany. Yeah, absolutely, and I have to give a big shout out. We have a lot of advocacy groups in this town who are doing that very crucial, important work, and you know, we, we can't really, you know, as a one person show, I can't really be everywhere all the time. So I got to give a lot of props to those folks who are given their time to do that kind of work. Great. Keep it up. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, so the next agenda, I didn't ask staff if this was okay. We move, are you, are you good with that, Mike? We move. We made three people very happy. I bet I, I bet we did. <laughs> so we're going to, we're going to move to. If you're looking at your agenda, item number five will now be number three. So it's the Brook Avenue right away adjacent to 118 Brook Street. And we have a staff, rep and, uh, staff presentation. Welcome. Um, <clears throat> so this is. Um, Vacation of a triangular shaped uh, section of right of way. It is uh, about nine square feet. Um, I think I'll just show you the pictures. This is pretty straightforward. So, this is a picture of Brook Street from the corner of Brooks and Forbes. You can see it's, um, well, you can't tell, but it's a one way street. Uh, it's fully built out. Uh, Public Works doesn't have any intentions of trying to widen it. Most of the right of way is out in the uh, Pilkington Creek, the center line. And this is the end of the road. If you've ever driven down there, it's a pretty slow moving one way road. The houses are all very close to the edge of the right of way. This is a close up of the uh, first three homes. They're all about 18 inches from the original right of way. Um, the house in question is this third one, 
and it's this little sliver of the house that's hanging over into the public right of way. Uh, same with the deck up above, uh, same with the next door neighbor up above. So this is the original subdivision map. Uh, you can see the three lots are uh, pretty standard. Um, the tax assessor has been taxing them based on that rectangular shaped lot, um, probably to this day. And then the applicant came in with um, a set of plans for a remodel in July and it included this survey. And so the survey was a little disturbing. Um, there's a, a note on the survey that referred to a deed that had been recorded, I think it was in 1906, uh, where the city asked for, you can see this dashed line was the old edge of the right of way and for whatever reason, and, and I can't figure it out, Public Works didn't know, they asked for this line to change to here. So the, the item in front of you tonight is to abandon that nine square feet of right of way. What it will do is it will put that house on private property. It won't have the corner of the house on public property. Uh, the applicant can't do an addition to the house um, unless it's all on their property. Any future addition that they do is going to require a coastal permit and a design permit for the substandard lot findings. Um, we also, when you do an abandonment, we have to do the advertising according to state law. So we did our regular postcards 300 feet, 14 days ahead of time. Then it's got to be posted in the newspaper two weeks in a row, and it has to be posted on site. And I haven't had a call, phone call or an email, no questions about it at all. Um, That's it, we're recommending that you recommend the city council to approve this vacation of right of way and approve the coastal permit. And I've got the coastal permit findings uh, attached to the draft resolution. Do you have any questions? And the applicants here. Shall we have them address the commission first? If they want. Yeah. Invite the applicant to address the commission. Welcome. And, uh, Matthew Thompson uh, representing uh, Sherry. Um, Busby, the owner. The only things that I would add really is that um, uh, the fact that in 1906 there was this boundary adjustment to uh, change the alignment for the public right of way um, doesn't seem to have ever um, actually found its way into the surveyor's office or into the assessor's office. So if you look at the county's uh, base map at their GIS office, it still shows it as its original rectangular shape. The assessors um, never take into account the 1906 change. So they've been, uh, all the owners over the years have been paying taxes on the rectangular shape, not the, the, uh, the, the portion that was just changed. So in a sense, um, what we're just asking uh, the commission to do is recognize that what's just been uh, understood by everybody except uh, um, uh, our surveyor who um, perhaps worked a little too hard and found a, a, a deed change back in 1906. And um, uh, it just is, uh, I think, good government to make sure that our houses are actually sitting on, on the property that they have always assumed they owned. And um, this doesn't have any effect on the alignment of the road. Uh, ironically, um, Sherry uh, Busby's um, house has the largest setback to the back of the curb of any of the houses al along this block. So um, uh, there aren't any other houses along the block where you could park a truck between the house and the back of the curb. So um, I don't see any public um, uh, uh, pejorative uh, part of doing this little bit of housekeeping and and making sure that her house sits on her land. Thanks. Thank you. Any questions for staff or the applicant from commissioners? Move the staff recommendation. At, um, we hearing. should open, I'm gonna open it up to public comment first. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought that was public. <laughs> so. Um, no, I don't think there's gonna be a lot. Well, we'll, <laughs> I, we'll see. Um, so we will open it up for public comment, open the public hearing, and invite anyone to address the commission before we um, make a decision on this. Seeing none, then I would invite a motion to... So moved. The staff recommendation. Second. Any discussion? 
All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Um, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you. <clears throat> and now we're on the original item three. That was five, and now we're back to three. So this is the consent agenda. And Commissioner Schifrin, are you, are you intending to pull this then? Yes, I okay. think so, because it's at the, uh, the item that was mailed out late is at odds with the item that we got earlier. So I okay. think we should sort of make sure we're all talking about the same uh, set of guidelines. Here. Okay. So um, I just get some clarification on that. So you're saying that, so you we're first going to correct the minutes to match the way you recommended it? Yes. And then we'll move on to well, um, the- That's already been done. <laughs> oh, we I- move, We moved the minutes as corrected. And so now, now you're moving on to, okay, got it, thank you. we're just talking about what seems to be a revised uh, set of guidelines, slight, somewhat revised set of guidelines mm -hmm. from the staff <coughs> that are different from what was approved last year, at the last meeting. So go ahead, do you wanna um, launch into what, uh, issues you have with that or the changes that uh, surprised some, you? Uh, actually, pretty minor changes. Um, on the first page where it says uh, under uh, the public speaking, it was for the public to understand the procedures, it says please contact there prior to the meeting if you have questions about the agenda. The public input period, then it says it's best used to present your views on an issue. It sort of implies that it could be used in some other way. And so I think it would be a little bit clearer to just say the public input period is the time to present your views on, on the issue. I think that just sort of makes it a little bit clearer about what the expectation is. And then I do think at the bottom of- Can I interrupt you for a second? I'm not, I wanna make sure I'm following you. Say again, you'd like it to say what instead? Where the public input period is the time to present your views on an issue as opposed to the best use, is best used to present your views. Okay. I think that just sort of clarifies it a little in terms of, I didn't really understand, it sort of opened up the possibility that you might use it poorly, so I, I'm not sure. It's happened. Um, yeah, I'm sure it has, <laughs> uh, but uh, I think to be on a more positive side is to just say that's the time yeah. to tell us what you think. Okay. And then also, again, it doesn't, the proposed changes don't include the sentence about signing in. That seems to be uh, completely eliminated from this, um, this uh, rendition. And so I think, it's, I think it's, since we do want to encourage people to sign in to the record, um, putting that sentence, which was under oral communications last time, uh, and the sentence was, speakers may sign the sheet placed near the speaker's stand so that their name may be accurately recorded in the meeting minutes. I think that sentence should be after the, the paragraph that starts, pre prepare your comments beforehand for the most efficient use of your time. So I, the guidelines to me um, read as part, part of the sections are sections of the agenda and part of the sections are this addresses to you as an individual or this address to a group. And the time, um, the signing in thing is under individuals. So if I'm an individual and I read that section, then it maybe affects what you're wishing for. You, do you see that? The, the, the recommendation to sign is in is under individuals. Would that satisfy what you're wishing for? Below oral communication? So addressing the commission during oral communication. Oh, an audible tone for the record. Oh, okay, right. You That's think fine. That, you that think takes that care of it. I missed that. Yeah. Um, although I would point out that in that paragraph, uh, it says all remarks shall be addressed to the council as a whole, and that should be commission. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the only other uh, uh, suggestion that I would make that's kind of um, subs a little more substantive is at the top of the page two where it says um, uh, what's crossed out is a maximum of 15 minutes total may be set aside. And what we said last time um, was that the, <coughs> find it right now, but what it says here is that um, the presiding officer may set the time limit, and then it says generally 15 minutes total for members of the public. I don't have any problem with the presiding officer setting the time limit, but I'm, 
I just think saying generally 15 minutes, if we have a lot of people in the audience, it's going to take more than 15 minutes. And I, I just think it's enough to say the presiding officer can set the amount of time, and whatever that is would depend on how many people are there, how many people want to speak. Um, and just it just seems 15 minutes just does it. It seems like if there were five people, that's going to be at three minutes each. That, that would be the end of the time period. It could be more. So I'd just like to leave it more vague, which is what was approved last at the last meeting. Commissioners will remember. I think I'll put it at discretion of the chair. And yeah. I, mean, I read that as generally 15 minutes. But it, it almost sounds like it should be about 15 minutes each. Commissioner Conway, when do you have a take on it? I'm getting nods from folks, but well, not from you. Just, just that um, I don't have a strong feeling about it. I mean, the key point is that the presiding officer can set a time limit if, if needed, but this is for oral communications for items that are not on the agenda. Um, so um, a guideline of how much time will be spent on that prior to getting to um, the actual agenda kind of makes some sense to me. It's not carved in stone. Um, and uh, you know we don't we don't get a lot of public comment on items not on the agenda, so I didn't I didn't mind that um, having a suggestion of um, how much time is spent on that since we often do spend a great deal of time on public comment <laughs> for items that are on the agenda. I um, I, th I read it as vague as well, and I, th I thought it would be helpful for a junior chair. Because sometimes you wonder how long should I give for this and stuff like that. But do you, um, Commissioner Shippen, do you want to? Um, I think you've got most of the agreeable um, right. suggestion. Not, what, how did, would you like it to read? Uh, I, it's not a huge issue if the uh, the commissioners feel they want to leave a specific time in. I just think if there, if we do have a meeting where a lot of people show up, and this is you know they read this, they're going to say, well, the commission's just going to try to cut us off. And I don't think that's the intent of the commission. Um, so keeping it up to the presiding officer, I think, is a reasonable thing to do. And I think that is a, a better message for uh, a new chair that, in fact, we're not, we're not hoping to keep it to 15 minutes. We want to keep it reasonable, but we want to let people mm -hmm. speak if they want to speak. So it's, that would be my preference, but I, mm -hmm. I don't feel strongly about it. Um, are there other changes that you'll be? Uh, well, the, no, those, uh, there are other things I thought the staff was a little bit, um, other changes to what we talked about last time, but I, I'm fine with them. And uh, I'd be prepared to support when it's appropriate time, the, the guidelines as uh, reformatted and changed by the staff uh, with a change from is best used to the time. Um, and changing the word council to commission, and I would prefer to just take out the generally 15 minutes for all commissions. Tess, do you have a input? Uh, I didn't author this. This was the, the work of my um, supervisor, but uh, she did talk to me about um, the things that were inserted, and these are excerpts from the city council handbook, so it's not something that staff devised. Mm -hmm. It's something that the city council has reviewed and adopted uh, previously. I think it's notated in quotations after each section of the things that were added, uh, whether or not it came from the city council handbook or the planning commission bylaws. And those are things that have previously been adopted. Okay, so do, do, do you bring that up because you have concern with any of the slight amendments we've made or just FYI? I just wanted to point out that I, th I, I believe the reason why those were added was for further clarification from existing documents that have previously been adopted by the city council. Right, and if I may, um, I, I, part of it was to make it a little easier because this document references the city council handbook, and so to avoid having to go back and forth and continue to reference what does it say in the handbook about these issues, uh, staff believe that it would make sense to go ahead and just put it in here and reference the handbook. Let me just say that the city council has issues with oral communication that we exactly. do not have. Exactly. And uh, Commissioner Shippen, Kevin, I missed the, the meeting way. and I couldn't hear you in some, when I watched it, so I'll invite you to. The city council has issues with oral communications that I haven't been aware of the, the commission having. And I think, I don't know when the last time they were able to have 15 minutes of oral communication. If you read their minutes, yeah. the number of people who speak, they'd have to give them about 10 seconds each. So. Um, 
I just think it's fine to just say the presiding officer is going to set the time because that's what that's the way it's going to be. Okay. Any other comments? Uh, questions. Um, we'll invite the public to address the commission on this issue, uh, on this agenda item. If you have any, please come up and share them. Any comments? Seeing none, then um, I wanted to say that uh, since I missed, I missed the opportunity to, to discuss this at length like you all did last time, I'm okay with the information item section being that it's okay that we can move on that, but I hope we never do it. And the reason I'm okay with it is because from a, a productivity and efficiency standpoint, sometimes we're discussing something and we realize, oh, we can't move on this because um, it's in the wrong section. The wrong section, it's in information items only instead of general business. But I do think it's practice that the, um, so I'm glad that it's, we're, we've got this because if we wanted to move something, we can and make some progress. But I do think it's practice and tradition that the public assumes things in the information item section won't get moved on. If I read something listed in the information item section, I think, okay, I'm going to have another crack to go um, def have my say and shape the decision on this. So I hope, I like this because it lets us move and doesn't tie our hands, but I hope we use it pretty um, sparingly. And I don't really think it changes that much between the information item section and the general business. So. I have a little bit of an issue about that. I just wanted to state for um, for consideration when we actually use it. Uh, were you want to? Were you ready to make a motion? Yeah, there? I'd make a motion that we approve the proposed revised planning commission meeting guidelines, changing the words on page one where it says is best used to uh, saying uh, input input period. The time is the time to present your views. And then um, changing the under individuals, the word council to commission, and then at the top of the page, uh, deleting the words generally 15 minutes total after the words the presiding officer may set the time limit. Second. So we have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Um, it passes unanimously, 7 0. So um, thank you for staff helping us. Uh, get towards that and um, good work I think by the Commission uh, well last week I asked that this come back on the consent agenda to see if everything was captured but I don't think it needs to come back anymore I think <laughs> we're done with it moving on so moving on to the next agenda item is uh, general business and this is review of the this did come back from last time so this is the housing element and general plan annual report update um, and I watched um, I'm going to do something a little bit differently instead of invite staff to give a report because you were all here and I wasn't. And so this tied and bylaws say it comes back. The item comes back. Um, the way I benefited from watching your conversation, um, this, you know, like you all did, got all the staff, inf the information from staff, staff report and attachments, um, watched your discussion, public comment, and your debate, and saw you tie 3-3. Three, three. So I think a really efficient way to do this is to um, kind of step in as the tie-breaking vote, and we could just vote and move right now. But I don't want to truncate it too quickly. Um, this is a continuation of the prior item, so we wouldn't have to open it up to the public because the public has, given, has been given a chance to have their say on this. But... Um, Sorry. Yeah. I, the, the agenda says. Can I, let, let me finish because okay. you might not disagree with um, where I'm going with it. Um, so I don't think we have to do that, but um, we, I, I think I will open it back up to the public and I, I think it's possible that some of you may have changed your vote, but I'm just um, teeing it up this way so that I think we can be efficient and not go over much of what the, of the discussion that we had last time. Um, and I will open it up to the public um, after we discuss it for a little bit. Commissioner Schifrin, do you want to? Right. I would just refer to what the agenda, uh, <laughs> cover agenda says, which is uh, under general business review of the 2018 housing element and general plan annual reports as submitted to the State Department of Housing and Community Development and consideration of when the general 
travel plan corridor and golf club drive area policies will be placed on a future planning commission agenda it does not specify that we're simply going to vote on them if i was a member of the public who wasn't here i would think that this was a time when the commission could talk about the consideration of when the corridor uh, general plan corridor and golf club drive area plan policies would be placed on a future agenda so I, I think it's pretty clear that we can talk about the, everything that's in this, uh, that's stated in the, in the presentation. We can, and I understood the staff report to say, we're gonna bring it back to you in July, most likely, and that's not a date certain, and so that's what we have. We have a proposal by staff to, telling us when they'll bring it, and I observed all of you discuss whether it should be date certain or whether it should be the very next meeting and you were split on that. Well, from my perspective, if I could say what all I wanted to do since at the last meeting, the corridor, uh, the general plan corridor and the uh, golf club drive area policies were not even listed. So we really couldn't talk about them at all. What I wanted was to just have them agen agendized so we could talk about them. And I don't have a problem with the staff recommendation to when they're gonna work on it, but I just think this is an opportunity where we can do what the city council asked us to do, which is bring up policies and talk about them ourselves. What we decide to do about them, um, I think we could, the commission could just decide to do what the staff is, is recommending. I have, my, I have a recommendation I'd like to talk about to the commission that is a little bit different from that, but I think the public can tell us what they want and we can, what the commission wants to do but my only concern last time is to was to be act and be able to act consistent with what the City Council asked us to do which was review these policies mm -hmm. uh, and that's the reason why I'm fine to re rescind my motion from last time is because it's the goal of the motion has been achieved I wanted to get these mentioned in the, the two policies mentioned in the agenda are mentioned in the agenda that means we can talk about them um, under the Brown Act so um, to my mind approving the motion or denying the motion or voting on the motion isn't really what's relevant what's relevant is that what's before us is an agenda item that allows us to have some discussion about these policies that the City Council asked us to review but staff have not prepared us with any materials to discuss these so we can discuss it, but we should, I, as chair, I think we should discuss it when staff has informed us with their staff report. It would, and so they've said what they'll give us. They've said when they're prepared to give us information to have that discussion is in July. So I'm not sure why we would have a discussion absent staff input on it. Because, well, you know, the council asked us to review it. We can talk about it. Your, your approach is one approach. Mm -hmm. um, what my suggestion is going to be is, given the situation with the corridor plan and the inconsistency between that has been talked about a good deal between the general plan policies and the zoning ordinance policies, it would make sense to ask the council to give some guidance to staff when they bring this forward to be responding to that guidance. And in terms of the golf club drive, since the general plan calls for uh, the creation of an area plan, to ask the city council to initiate the area plan. So I'm, I don't, I agree completely that it's not appropriate to be taking action on the policies at this point uh, because we don't have staff analysis, we don't have uh, a, st a staff recommendation. I, what you got tonight and which I sent to the staff a couple of days ago was my own you know, sort of review of the general plan in terms of, of corridor policies and my, and my review of the zoning ordinance so that I could understand why I keep hearing that there's this inconsistency. I didn't really know what it meant. Now I think I have a better idea of what it means. Um, and I do think it makes sense given that there are these differences between the zoning ordinance uh, request that the council provide some guidance to the staff so that when they, they bring it back they have some indication of where the city council is coming from 
Mr. Chair, may I jump in? Sure. Um, so I just want the commission to be careful because what is agendized is a conversation about when the items will be placed on the agenda, not the items themselves. And the staff report um, is focused on the housing element as well as the former motion that was made. So I think to be compliant with the Brown Act, we need to be very careful about how we talk about these items and try to stick to the uh, motion that was made previously and the housing element annual report and um, general plan annual report if you had any further questions on those. So what I'd like to do is potentially um, move us, I think we, we have, a staff recommendation that is A and B, and I think we've got really clear um, consensus, I believe, anyway, on A, that all we're doing is receiving the report. And um, I will open that up to public comment, but what I'm, I'm gonna suggest is that we do that and then close the public comment and then vote on that and move along and then we can wrestle with B. How's that sound? Okay, so um, we have a, the, we, um, the commission is really all we're doing is receiving a report from staff. Council has already received this. You, if you were here last time, you may have heard that uh, some commissioners wished that the sequence would be that the commission receives the report and then it goes to council, but staff has to submit these numbers to the state and they've done so and they've told city council about that and last time they told this commission about that. So all we're doing is receiving that. Um, if you would like to address us on either the golf club drive or the general plan corridor zoning alignment um, effort or the housing annual report, um, please address the commission. Come up and do that now, please. You can line up on the right side, please. We'll give everyone three minutes and um, please sign in. And as you come to the lectern address, um, please, as you address the commission, state your name if you're willing. And we are not going to talk about the golf club drive plan. We're going to talk about when we will talk about the golf club drive area plan. And we're gonna talk about when we will um, talk about the general plan and zoning ordinance alignment. That's how the agenda reads. Yes, my name is Alan Holbert and uh, you should have received a, an email, uh, but on the off chance that you didn't print it and bring it with you, uh, I have copies coming around. I'm want to particularly look at the final paragraph of this uh, short letter. And we're interested in getting the Planning Commission to recommend to the City Council that they forward uh, guidance for the Commission and the staff uh, in terms of what's going on with the corridors plan, so-called. Uh, it's unclear. It's supposed to be on the back burner, but uh, apparently it's moving forward at this point to one of the front burners. And so we'd like to get clarity on where that is. And uh, so if the commission is so inclined, they could forward the information to the city council and ask them for advice and guidance in terms of uh, where the corridors plan is currently going. So that's really what our request is. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lisa Rose. Um, some of you may remember me. I came here a couple weeks ago to, um, on behalf of Common Roots Farm, um, formerly Costanoa Commons Farm. Greg, you're new to this, so you weren't here. Um, uh, even though we've changed our name, our mission is still the same. We're a nonprofit, organic, 
uh, urban farm of Golf Club Drive, um, where people with disabilities and without disabilities grow healthy food and beautiful flowers and build community. Um, we are in a long-term lease with our landlords because our mission and vision is very compatible with the goals of our landlord. Um, I explained a little bit of the uh, growth that we've had in the last six months to a year. Um, we are in our second year of production uh, with our farm vegetables and fruits and flowers and hydroponic farming in our greenhouse. Um, we have hired our first paid intern who has disabilities. Um, Carson and he helps out with our chickens and our eggs and because we are a farm dealing with people with disabilities we've hired our first um, inclusion specialist so she is working with everybody all the farmers and the volunteers to make sure that everyone can participate fully on our farm and we're lucky to uh, and welcome uh, Santa Cruz City Schools workability students to get them out on the farm and train them uh, for their pre-employment um, education. So a lot of growth and we really want to continue and expand what we're doing. Again, our second year of our farm stand and we're debuting uh, our first year of our community supported agriculture and we're starting to have some outreach projects with the Tannery and Arts Council at their Mother's Day Art Fair and um, a first Friday ebb and flow where we bring out our portable uh, greenhouse and show people what we're doing. Anyway, so it's on behalf of our board of directors that I would um, like to request that the city uh, start the, the area plan and do so in an open and transparent way. Um, I really feel that we at Common Roots Farm are going to be um, an, a resource, a very valuable resource for the community for years to come. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you for your comments. Good evening. My name is John Swift. I'm a property owner out in the Gulf Coast Drive area. And um, given the limited focus of the discussion tonight, I'm going to advocate for a July hearing so that staff can thoroughly give you advice and, and uh, input on the area corridor plan and the area plan. Uh, very involved in the quarter plan in the years past. I was on the committee. So a lot of uh, vetting of that plan occurred, a lot of discussion. And I certainly hope that we don't move in a direction of downzoning that quarter. I hope we recognize the incredible housing demand that we have now. Well, not only demand, but also the, the problem, the crisis, of course. Uh, we need that density, and I hope that we don't go in the opposite direction. Likewise, in Golf Club Drive, the area plan took uh, not the area plan, but the general plan, 2030 general plan, took 12 years to develop after hundreds of neighborhood meetings and, and public meetings. Uh, the decision was made that that's a, a reasonable place for a, a sizable amount of density that will have an impact, set significant impact on our housing supply. So I hope that we don't move in the wrong direction. But I am all for this, the, the city council having a discussion about moving that area plan forward. I think it's time. And I think the housing need is so sufficient and so severe so significant and so severe that it would be a mistake to delay it any further. And we're going to see where people stand on the housing issue. Are they really talking about housing but not approving housing, which seems to be the modus operandi of the current, some of the current council members? I mean, that's, that's a problem. And that's not getting us in the direction of where the general plan talks about and all the rhetoric that has talked about this housing crisis. We consistently deny housing projects, consistently make them difficult to approve, expensive to develop. I can go on and on and on. It's just hot air rhetoric until we get serious, do an area plan, as Andy suggests, and I, I commend him for stepping forward and suggesting that, that should move forward, but I hope it goes in a direction of supporting housing and not the opposite direction of going back to creating a buffer to the buffer, which we do not need. The open space in Poganip was established as a buffer to the urban core, the urban center. And we need to build to that in recognition of the housing crisis that we have. To do otherwise would be totally irresponsible, in my opinion. Humble opinion, but who am I? You guys are the decision makers. Hope you make the right one. Thanks. Thank you for your comments. Welcome. Hello, my name is uh, Evan Siroki. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> speaking about the quarter plan, 
y'all should just make it zoning, code it, get it done with. Uh, and I'd like to point out that there's recently been some uh, statewide legislation that's been passed that uh, there's two things I like to highlight. Uh, there's uh, now a uh, law in place that says that the Housing Accountability Act uh, applies even to projects that conform with the general plan. And there's also uh, uh, statewide legislation that says that there may be no net loss of uh, zoning capacity, even if it's in the general plan. So I uh, just encourage you to uh, yeah, codify the general the corridor plan into uh, zoning code and uh, move on. Thanks. Thank you for your comments. Welcome. Thank you. I'm Philippe Habib. Probably too short for that thing. Um, Philippe Habib. I'm uh, also one of the landowners on Golf Club Drive. I represent a group of parents of young adults with developmental disabilities and our mission is to provide them as well as other members of our community with an affordable place to live as well as to support the rest of the community uh, with uh, Common Roots Farm and to continue the over 125 years of history of farming and providing healthy food to Santa Cruz residents. Um, I would like to encourage the Planning Commission to ask the City Council to provide uh, guidance and a timeline for creation of an area plan for Golf Club Drive so that we can move forward with it and have some certainty about uh, what will be happening to the street. And we would like uh, that plan to be city-led and to uh, happen in an open process that involves uh, the community. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Welcome. My name's Rebecca Dorschel. I grew up on Golf Club Drive. Uh, Hoganip was my backyard my whole life. I still own the property on Golf Club Drive. I inherited it from my mother two years ago. Um, Golf Club Drive has changed. The housing needs in, in Santa Cruz County and Santa Cruz City limits have changed. The, um, I have a son-in-law that works for Santa Cruz PD. He can't afford to buy a house. There is no housing available. And I do encourage the city to proceed with the area plan that we all worked on for years, years. My family's been bound by area plans and requirements for most of the 65 years my family's owned that property. And um, I think it's time to move ahead and put together a responsible area plan and make, make something happen for the community that is going to help the community and people like my son-in-law, my daughter who live in my house in Soquel because they can't live anywhere else in Santa Cruz. So I encourage you to proceed with that as soon as quickly as possible. Thank you for your comments. This is the last chance to address the commission on this item if anyone else would like to. Thank you everyone for uh, addressing the commission and I apologize for the confusion on what the agenda item is. You're seeing some, if not confusion, maybe disagreement even amongst the commissioners on what this, what's in, what's agendized and what's not agendized and whether we're talking about an item or talking about when we'll talk about an item. So um, thanks for enduring that uncertainty on uh, um, <coughs> Commissioner Conway. No, I, I was just waiting for you to clarify how you intend to proceed. Yeah, so I would invite it. I don't think we need to go backwards. We've received the report on the uh, housing figures, the annual report. So I would um, I think it would be clean if someone would suggest a motion on that. I would move that we uh, approve the uh, recommendation A in our staff report to accept the report on the 2018 housing element and general plan annual reports <coughs> as submitted to the um, Department of Housing and Community Development. Is there a second? A second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes unanimously. Um, so <coughs> that's uh, 7 0. And now we can discuss item B. Would any commissioner like to? I'd like to. Okay, I'm Commissioner sorry. Conway, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I was actually going to um, move the staff recommendation. Is there no second? There's a motion and a second. Is there discussion of the motion? Yes. Go ahead. Um, I want to point out first that 
that motion is fine but it doesn't necessarily end the discussion of this item um, I'm happy to rescind that motion since I all I wanted was to have this on the agenda but I want to point out that the agenda we have includes a uh, statement of that there is consideration of when the general plan corridor and golf club drive area plan policies will be placed on a future agenda so the staff made a record a couple of recommendations that's fine the Commission can do them or not but in fact the Commission doesn't isn't limited in talking about simply what the staff is recommended uh, re is recommending one way or the other we can talk about other related um, issues and um, I'm I think it's totally appropriate to talk about the whole notion of the timing of when these uh, general plan policies are going to be considered. Uh, and I, as I said before, I think as part of that, it's totally legitimate to ask the city council to provide some guidance on those issues. When do they want the city council, do they want the commission to deal with them? Do they have guidance for how the commission should deal with them? Obviously, from the testimony we have tonight, these are controversial issues, and which is one of the reasons why nothing's been done. Um, and I agree with uh, the speakers who seem unanimous that they want something done. They might not agree on what they want done, uh, and we won't probably agree on what, what all agree on what should be done. But there are um, problems with um, with the uh, corridor policies and that corridor, the general plan calls for a mi uh, high density mixed use, uh, 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 mixed use high density zone on Soquel and water. It doesn't appear in the, uh, in the zoning ordinance. The zoning ordinance, as I understand it, is community commercial. That needs to be dealt with and it's been put off uh, I, I think I remember the general plan was approved in 2012. So I think that asking the council to um, prioritize the, they're going to be considering what their priority projects are. As staff has mentioned, uh, they have a lot of, they have a lot on their plate. I think it's legitimate for the commission to ask the council what, how, what a, kind of a priority do they want to give to these uh, two issues and what kind of guidance they might want to give to the commission and the staff in dealing with these issues. Uh, I think that's uh, completely consistent with what's on the, um, on the agenda, uh, what's this, uh, written in the agenda. And, uh, you know, I hope after action is taken on this motion, which I would, I'm not even sure we need to do the motion because I'm happy to rescind the, the motion that I made last time uh, because I think it's, uh, Redundant. It's unnecessary. I think it's achieved its purpose. Check on that. I would like to say, uh, Commissioner Schiffman, um, first of all, welcome to the Planning Commission. I'm glad you're here. Um, and, you know, you, you are new. I know you've been watching the process from afar. So, first of all, of course, you know that, of course, the zoning code is in inconsistent with the general plan. There's a new, the way the process works is those thousands of hours of meetings that you referenced around the general plan did occur. There was a lot of participation. A general plan was adopted. And the next step in the process is to update the zoning code. Um, that process was undertaken. It is a tremendously complex process. Um, we've had a number of people reference that. I think some of us here were on both the committee as well as the planning commission hearing hundreds of hours of testimony. Um, we actually had made a good deal of progress, I would say. Other, others may uh, say the same thing in the evolution of that, of that update um, when work on it was stopped. Um, but we do have to recognize how complex it is, how important it is. There isn't a way to take a shortcut around the process and end up with, with where we're trying to go. Um, so. I appreciate that um, you have some, um, you know, you're antsy to get it going. I think a lot of us are because we know it's important. It's important to our community. But I don't think it's helpful to um, interrupt the process, you know, and stop it because, they're, you know, the work that staff is doing and trying to stack it up. So that's really my point on let's let them get to work. 
on um, on moving that forward um, in, along the process. That's my point. Do other commissioners have thoughts to share? Commissioner Singleton. I I largely agree with the sentiments uh, of Commissioner Conway. Um, you know, I think the amount of work and staff time it takes to get all of that before us, and the amount of preparation it will take to get that report before us, and they've given us a rough timeline that I find satisfactory given the tremendous undertaking that it is. So I'm comfortable with uh, the rough timeline that staff's been giving us and giving them the space to do their work, and I'm confident that this commission will have ample opportunity to weigh in on these issues um, very soon, within the next couple months, so. Mr. Nielsen? Um, yeah, I, I would, I, I agree with, uh, I agree with all that as well. And um, I, I think the thing that I would add is, is that we've heard from staff that they do have a, a list of priorities and that have been dictated um, by city council. And so if city council wants to change that priority list, then they have the authority to do that and they can do that on their own. I don't think we need to ask them for, uh, for some sort of um, guidance on um, on how they choose their priorities. I think they choose them as they see fit and uh, we should allow them to do that. Commissioner Greenberg, do you wanna weigh in? Um, I'm interested in hearing the discussion and it makes sense to me. Um, and, you know, I, I realize that there is this, as I said last time, this kind of urgency um, around uh, projects that have been put on the staff's plate um, around homelessness and the, and the rental task force. Um, and I wonder, you know, given that there's a new commission and I'm new to this, I mean a new council, excuse me, and given that I'm new to this commission, what the, what happens when there's a new council that comes in and they're kind of coming in midstream to a timeline? And is there usually communication that goes on between the commission and the council along those lines? I, you know, I, I don't know, but it, it sounds like, um, so with, with what's been said about, they, they should know what their priorities are. So, yeah. Vice Chair Spellman, do you wanna weigh in? Yeah. Um, yeah, th it has been no small undertaking, the work and progress that we did make on the corridors plan. And it's been dormant now for over a year, mm -hmm. right? So um, we were making progress, but we were nowhere near, you know, the end of that process. And I agree with, with uh, the general sentiment here that it's gonna happen, sounds like shortly. Um, the only caveat I would make is I think we've had few opportunities to be proactive in, in how we make suggestions to council. And I think there is some consensus about let's move these things along. Let's at least communicate that, hey, we'd like to do the work. Why don't we do it? Yeah. So from that perspective, I think it makes sense to make that recommendation. Commissioner Schifrin. I think I appreciate hearing the um, um, immense amount of work that went into producing the general plan. And, but I think it's important to remember that why the, the council put the, uh, the zoning ordinance amendments on hold, because that's essentially what happened. Uh, there was a process moving forward to amend the zoning ordinance so it would be consistent with the general mm -hmm. plan and the uh, council, and this was before the election, uh, the council said, we're gonna not do this at this time. Why did that happen? It happened because there was a upsurge of community opposition to the way the, what the, the extent of what those policies were. And reading them over, I can, I've started to understand why that was the case. It is, they, they are a major change. Whether that's the desirable change or not, the fact of the matter is that the city council has not been willing to push forward with, you know, simply implementing those policies in the general plan. And that's why I think it's important as we wait for the staff to be ready to bring us a full discussion of them, that the council provide some guidance. Because if we're gonna spend a bunch of time um, restating what's already been stated, and the city council isn't gonna like it, 
we're just going to be wasting our time. I think it's important for the council to sort of give some guidance on how do they do they do they want the zoning ordinance to simply reflect what the policies are in the general plan, or do they want to see some changes in the general plan policies that would bring the zoning ordinance and the general plan into consistency? It might not be exactly the way the general plan reads now, but I think bef you know we're the, the 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 process was put on hold because there was significant public opposition to those policies. I think it's important to recognize that. And one of the ways of recognizing it is to ask the city council to provide some guidance to the, um, to the staff uh, and to let us know if there is a sentiment up there, what that sentiment is. So that can be also part of the consideration so that we don't, we don't end up spinning, spinning our wheels here when it finally does come to it, to us. I don't have any problem with the timing. Um, it's, I understand that the staff is busy. I understand that the city council makes the priorities. That's, you know, that's clear to me anyway. Um, what I'm concerned about is what we're going to get when we get it and why, and the hope that what we're able to be responding to and produce is going to ultimately get implemented so that we can remove this inconsistency between the general zoning ordinance, because I think it is a real problem. We've heard unanimously that um, whether people want a lot of development in Golf Club Drive or they don't want a lot of development in Golf Club Drive, they want the, the area plan to, uh, to be started. And so, you know, sending a recommendation to the council to initiate the process, that doesn't tell staff that they have to do it the day after tomorrow, but there is a formal action to initiate a general plan amendment. And I think that's what the public testimony we had is uh, suggesting, and I think that's that's a reasonable request to ask of the council, because th in terms of the timing, um, nothing's going to be done on an area plan until that era, the, the initiation of the area plan, which is essentially a general plan amendment, is, um, is acted on. So, Commissioner Schiffen, are you, re re are you rescinding your motion? Yes. You are? Yes. Okay. So, we had a motion and a second. Um, uh, I don't know who seconded it, but hopefully they'd have to rescind <coughs> it as well. Well, it's so what's on the table is the staff recommendation. Right. That, that's the motion on the floor right. now. So we can. Well, so I'll actually, I think maybe your motion can't be rescinded, but we can. Um, we can vote on. You want go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to make a clarification. So. It is not my opinion at all that the reason why the corridor planning was stopped was because of opposition by the public to that. That is far from the case. There's certainly um, portions of the public who were opposed to certain policies, but that is not the reason why we stopped doing our work. We stopped doing our work because of the housing emergency and the focus that went on to that issue. So any idea that it was because of opposition to what the corridor plan was heading towards is, is a not an accurate statement. We let staff weigh in on this. Yeah, so um, I think that's a very fair point. Um, there was a lot of eyes on housing at the time, and so what the council chose to do was to put a pause on the corridor's work and focus on the 2017 Housing Voices Outreach. That's the outreach that uh, took us through where uh, when then Mayor Cynthia Chase was um, doing her outreach. We had a lot of community discourse going to the community, getting feedback on what the community felt the issues were with housing. That's those 99 recommendations that came forward then out of that report in 2017. From that then, council decided to ch uh, form a housing blueprint subcommittee that would find a way to prioritize those recommendations. And last June, that was the housing blueprint subcommittee recommendations report that came out that had about 40 or so of those recommendations prioritized for staff to start to work on. And that really has been what the bulk of uh, the advanced planning team's work plan has been since June of last year. And as I mentioned at the last meeting, the corridors item was one of the things that was queued up to start again, but unfortunately we're still in uh, a pretty dire situation when it comes to uh, homelessness and some of the issues that weren't resolved when Measure M failed. And so 
what council has directed staff to do to since then is unfortunately again put a hold on that and focus on some of these real critical issues that need to be triaged and then potentially pick back up on that again after these issues are moving through the pipeline. So that's kind of where just to give some edification for the audience or the, the community as well as the planning commission kind of why things got stalled, where they're at now and why we're having the conversation that we're having. I want to chime in with my memory of the conversation which is um, this commission was extremely disappointed to have the corridors um, and the corridors and the, um, the zoning ordinance alignment with the general plan put on hold and the assistant city manager came and I asked her um, she you know she gave us that decision that that was that that was made and I asked her to whose decision it was she said it was the city manager's office um, now they report to city council so maybe that was direction from council but that's what I'm recalling and I think we may disagree on what um, the outcome is, but it does seem clear that everybody wants to get going on it. So it is, I think it is a timing issue. What we have is a staff recommendation that they bring this in, in July. And um, an awareness, highlight awareness that they have highlighted to us that council is gonna do a six month plan. So they're gonna bring it to us in July unless council throws them a curveball. And then it'll be whatever council tells them to do, and whatever the city manager tells them to do, because they don't. Staff doesn't report to city council. Staff reports to their department heads, and the department heads report to city manager. So um, I think it is a timing thing. We have heard from staff they're going to bring this in July. So I think we should vote on this, um, and And then we should, I think we should send something to council if we want to ask for more direction on expediting anything. It's a timing issue. Wait a minute. That, that, that's the opposite of the, of the recommendation. So I think we'd have to take first take action. Right. Okay. So <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming what, where we might go and I shouldn't do that. So um, I'm going to actually, everyone has, as chair, as presiding officer, I can limit debate as long as everyone has spoken and everyone has spoken. So we're going to have we're going to vote on the motion and um, that the which is to rescind the prior motion. Deny. It isn't to rescind. It's to deny. Thank you. The motion is to deny the prior motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So that was pa that passed unanimously and that was clean. Does I would move that we. Um, Support the staff recommendation to have the uh, corridor plan returned to the commission as soon as uh, as soon as it's ready. That we um, recommend that the chairperson provide a letter to the city council asking them to provide direction on the uh, corridor plan when it's being considered and to initiate an area plan uh, for the golf club drive area. Motion? Can I clarify that motion? Uh, Commissioner Schifrin, were you saying that the letter to council should ask for clarification on when both of those will happen? No. Okay. Uh, it was to ask for, to pr ask them to provide guidance on the... Um, Commissioner Schifrin, can you use your mic, please? Oh, sorry. Yeah. To provide guidance on the... Um, the work for the that's being done on the uh, corridor plan policies and to initiate the area plan for the golf club drive area. Is there a second? Well, we won't discuss a motion that doesn't have a second, but if there's a second, we'll discuss it. And if there's not a, if there's not a second, then we'll stare at each other until someone has a, another motion that, that is, offers a path forward. Um, we actually, we don't have to do anything. Um, so is, is there a sec there's not a second on this, so this motion fails. Is there another? I'm it can actually I, be done with his agenda item. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I don't think we have to do anything more. And But I do think we are all in agreement that we're very eager to pick up these policies and start actually talking about the policies instead of talking about talking about the policies. Right, right, okay. So thank you all for that. Thank you, staff. Um, and let's see, we did two, then five, then three, then four.
four, and that's all. For I would like the uh, minutes to reflect the motion. You have the motion as stated for the minutes? Yeah, okay. Then um, the next agenda item is uh, information items. Yes, um, let me pull them up on my phone one moment. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, hang on just a second. I keep going backwards. Um, right, so uh, first off, uh, the department presentation that we gave uh, to city council uh, at the last meeting in terms of the budget and kind of where we're at with a lot of our stuff um, is available for viewing. So that might be something that uh, any of the commissioners might be interested in looking at. Uh, in bigger news, I wanted to let you know that our assistant director, Alex Corey, has announced his resignation, or not resignation, his retirement, uh, which is a really big deal. He's been in the field for 40 years and with the city for 19. So um, this will be a, a big loss. We're really, really happy for him and excited for him and his next venture, but it will be a really big loss for the city. Um, just in, never mind institutional knowledge, but you know, personality and just all of the fun that he brings to work every day. So um, we did wanna let you know that uh, his last day is I believe June 4th. However, he does have some vacation saved up. So he'll be leaving uh, the city, city hall offices as a regular, you know, being there every day, uh, mid-May, I believe it's May 17th. Is there going to be an event? Um, I'm sure there will be an event, and we can make sure that the Planning Commission knows when that event is so that you can join us. Great. Yeah. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Any other information items? No. And um, any subcommittee or ad, um, advisory body oral reports? Yes. The uh, Westcliff Drive Adaptation Te uh, Technical Advisory Committee had its first meeting out on Westcliff and uh, wandered around from one uh, location to the other. I, uh, the the <laughs> intention as stated to sta by staff was to have quarterly meetings um, after reviewing the uh, scope of work for, uh, there are actually two studies that are being done. One is the adaptation uh, study for the cliffs and then the other is a beach um, sea level rise study that's really more related to the Coastal Commission concerns about local coastal program amendments. How that's all gonna be coordinated is a little unclear to me. And the, the scope of work has various tasks that need to be done. And I intend to contact uh, the staff to see whether it might make more sense to have the task force, the technical advisory committee meet, meet around the uh, when the deliverables come out mm -hmm. that, uh, for these various tasks, if the if the intention is to have the TAC play a meaningful role as opposed to just nodding when the staff and the consultants say this is what we want to do. Mm -hmm. And who's on the TAC? Just a, reminder. a lot of people. Okay. Um, there are representatives from um, <coughs> the Parks and Recreation Commission. There are somebody from the Coastal Commission's on there. There's, all, there's like 15 people on this tack. I don't remember. I'm sure we could get a list if the I'm commission wanted to see it. But it's very broad base. There's a realtor, there's surfer, there's people wearing numerous hats. So, and everybody's very concerned about Westcliff Drive. So mm -hmm. it's gonna be a, a difficult, a challenging uh, problem, but it's gonna be interesting as well. I bet it is, thanks for being on that tack. Um, any other advisory body oral reports? No, there aren't any other standing subcommittee reports. Okay. So with that, we'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.